So I just need to say, how did this come about that I'm going to talk about applied ethics and immunization programs and practice? It came about because previous advocates asked us to do this. So that's why you're getting this. I will say up front, I am not a PhD ethicist. I'm a clinician scientist. Yes, I've done clinical trials, but I've also looked after thousands and thousands of patients. And this is about the ethics of immunization programs and ethics around immunizers. So um, I want to start by saying a little tiny addendum to what uh, Kathy has already said. So the ethical principles are all as she laid out, but you'll notice at the bottom that this has now had a little addendum added to it. It's respect for community, but it's also respect for the environment. Because how you set up your programs, where you set them up, how you clean up afterwards, and what you use really can impact on the environment. And if you listen to what Phil said yesterday, you can see why that has been added to the ethical principles. So we could, there are many points for applied ethics, vaccine development, country regulator, procurement, what your national NITAG recommendations are, all kinds of ethics through all of that. But I'm just going to focus on the immunization program. And again, I, I keep using the word complex. Well, it's not simple because there's many different pieces in that immunization program we could talk about. I'm just going to hit some of the highlights for you. So... Here are seven principles. Uh, David Isaacs in Australia has written about this, and we've also written about this from Canada. Benefits, risks, effectiveness, equity and justice, autonomy and reciprocity and trust. I'm only going to talk because of limited time of the red ones. It doesn't mean that benefits don't count and there aren't ethics in this. I just don't have time to do them all. Okay, so we will run through and look at these. So let's start, start about risks. All right. This is a big issue. I told you yesterday, I, there are, there's pain with immunization and there are immunization stress related responses. And we know because there are CTs that have shown us that we can decrease this. So an immunization program that has not trained their frontline immunizers to decrease pain and decrease immunization stress-related responses, that's unethical. Because you know how to mitigate those things, or you should know how to mitigate those things. And the literature shows us and tells us how to do it, even in RCTs across the age span. So I did a little bit of this yesterday for pain, and I'm going to stress it again. It's unethical. WHO says it's unethical not to mitigate pain when you can do this. So how many of you, I'm just interested for people who are running immunization programs, how many of you have done pain mitigation training for your frontline immunizers? I see a few hands. I do not see, you know, this should be everywhere. WHO brought forward these recommendations in 2015. They're being updated because we've got more data now, more evidence but this should not be ignored. This is part of good practice, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a pharmacist, whether you're a doctor. You should not be ignoring this. Do it. Because all of us don't like pain either. So we want people to do that for us if we're going to be getting injections. And again, as I said, we know how to decrease immunization, stress-related responses. Decreasing pain is a piece of that. And then all the other things that are in card, comfort, ask relax and distract. You let people ask their questions, you provide them with comfort, you distract them, whatever they want to do, sing to them, whatever, ask them questions. Um, and we also know that uh, for somebody who's got a history of syncope, having them to do muscle tension does it. Not doing these steps is again unethical. All right, risks. I'm going to talk about moral injury. Um, a little bit about this. When you're a physician or a nurse or a pharmacist, what we're doing is we're caring for individual patients. Okay. But when we're doing public health and we're running immunization programs, we're caring for populations, not individuals. So sometimes our patients die and it's very stressful and we need to be doing our best and the best that it would be unethical not to do the best to look after your patient. But the problem for us when we're looking after a population, it's a much bigger ask. We know, as I briefly said yesterday, of the 17 sustainable development goals, immunization affects 14 of them. 
Okay. So you got to do this. Okay. And the problem is it's hard to do this. This is not a simple thing. So what happens is when we try really hard in public health or we try really hard as individual frontline immunizers, we do our really very best to get the populations that we're responsible for immunized and we fail because we couldn't do it. And we fail for different reasons. It may be because we didn't have the structural supports under us to be able to do it. How do you think a nurse in a district health center feels when people are showing up with their babies and there's no vaccine? All right. Just think about these things. So for moral injury, it's when this gets so bad, you're overwhelmed by it. It's unique to those who bear witness to intense uh, human suffering and cruelty. Specifically, it can arise when you feel undervalued and underappreciated in the job you're trying to do in immunization, particularly when the very people you're trying to help are now yelling at you or they're picketing you or they're demeaning you, okay? It's been well-recognized, moral injury has, in war veterans, military personnel, first responders, and now we're starting to understand about it in public health and around frontline immunizers. It can lead to a whole lot of signs and symptoms. It can lead to family conflict. It can lead to anger, depression, PTSD even, um, substance abuse, and spiritual struggle, where you just feel like you're going to give up. You can't do this anymore. It's a betrayal of what you need to do that's right and be supportive for doing it right, and you can't do it. And here's the tragedy. This was just an example that was in the news uh, last year about an Austrian um, physician who was providing COVID vaccine who was picketed and yelled at and screamed at and blah, 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 and he killed himself. All right. So one of the biggest problems we have when I talk about this to many um, public health people and immunizers are that everybody thinks it's burnout. OK, if it's burnout, if I give you a couple of weeks off and you come back, you feel fine. It's not what this is. This is different. And you can have burnout and moral injury, but you can also have moral injury without burnout. All right. And you need to sort this out and understand it. So the problem, why are you not getting support to do what you need to do? And why do you feel like, you know, I I can't accomplish my goals and I'm and I know that people are going to die if I don't do this well. Well, sometimes it's the institutional problems that are out there. They've got competing agendas, financial stress. They can't do it all. We don't have enough healthcare workers. All right. So are we going to pull people out of the ICU to give you more frontline immunizers or are we not? What are we trading off? That's how the other people that are managing it up here are trying to do. But you at the front line or you in the immunization program had no say in how that was going to be done. Or one that I heard, I was at the Canadian Immunization Conference uh, two weeks ago, and one of the people who came up to see our, after the talk we gave on this was, they said, you know what? I was told to catch up all those kids who got missed in our school-based programs, and they took half my nurses away because they needed them elsewhere. I said, how can I do this? We failed and we failed and we failed. Okay. And as she said, this is what I have. I now understand the name of what I've got as opposed to people, you know, she couldn't do the job. And the other one is hyper responsibility. We know what happens when we don't immunize. Look at the measles outbreaks that we're seeing. And this makes us feel terrible. And then barriers for patients Instead of being able to provide ease of access, they've moved us so we can't. It's the opposite of what we need to do. So it's very demoralizing. So what do we do to address moral injury? There's really three things that there's some evidence to do. This mostly comes from um, the literature around how to address this for uh, first responders. One of them is start talking about moral injury. Name it. Don't tell people they've got burnout because they don't. Um, included in the curriculum for continuing medical education and continuing nursing education. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Listen and share. Remember, no one is alone. That helps build resilience for this and ensure institutional support and opportunities to further discuss. Make clear boundaries around what you expect people to do. Don't give them half the resources that they had before and expect them to do three times the amount of work, okay? Because they'll fail. 
and they'll know they're fail, even if they're so committed. And lastly, we need to be talking up about personal safety. Okay. Um, if you're, if your immunizers or your public health people have to give a, a talk, um, you need to be sure that in public, that they're never doing this alone, that they've been properly trained up on how to do this. Ensure they have an exit strategy. So if the audience goes berserk, okay, and starts yelling and screaming, they've got a way out of there that's safe. Don't leave them to drown, all right? Don't ignore threatening emails and death threats. There are trolls out there. And trust your instincts. And there's a best practice guidance that came out of WHO Euro about if you're going to speak in public uh, to groups that are uh, vaccine deniers. Um, and then the personal safety, make sure that your people do have access to protective equipment if it's needed for in a situation. So if you're giving Ebola vaccine in an Ebola outbreak, they have to have the personal safety equipment. You should not be expecting them to do this otherwise. They need safety training. They need access to safety in the area. So if there's a war going on at the same time, that you can still be in a safe place and not get shot. We have lots of examples where immunizers have been killed, all right? And again, for the program, that's a disaster and makes them feel like they failed as well. So, and never alone, your exit strategy. And remember that if you are a program manager, not addressing this is unethical. You're leaving people out there in a situation without any supports, and that's just wrong. Now, shifting to effectiveness, um, your NITAGs are deciding what vaccines are needed in the communities that you're dealing with. There is an ethical parameter about this. They should not be wasting resources on vaccines that are inappropriate to the population, but they need to be tailoring their vaccines to fit what the epidemiology is and what's, and, and what the diseases are that are circulating in the community. There's a lot of data on how to do this, but the problem is sometimes some vulnerable populations who have different risk factors than the big general population are, are missed out in this. And that's, we're going to talk about equity in a minute and justice. But I just want to say that you have to be sure in your effectiveness stuff that you're doing this right. So one of the questions we were asked on the COVID working group for SAGE over and over and over again was, what data do we have for these vaccines in HIV positive people who are not on treatment? And over and over and over again, we don't have any data from these companies. So you have to make decisions without the data, but you kind of got left in limbo. And then you already heard the pregnancy stuff that was talked about before. What do you do when you don't have the data? Okay. And again, this is about ethics. Just turning around and saying, well, we don't have the data. I'm not going to give you any advice. That's not ethical. Okay. You, in theory, know more than, than the people out there know. They need advice that they can follow. So uh, some of the examples, rapid recognition of cholera outbreaks and putting in a vaccine program as quickly as you can. But don't pretend you don't notice it, even though it's going to cost more. Uh, change, if changing from two and three dose H HPV vaccines to one dose school programs. Recognition of new serious AEFIs and rethinking about how you're going to use your vaccines, whether this is myocarditis with mRNA and how, what are you going to do. You have to keep thinking as the data evolves and the science evolves. And it's unethical not to change if the data has changed. So uh, equity and justice, these are the values that have been put out, core framework values, human well-being, global equity, reciprocity, equal respect, national equity, and legitimacy. And what do those words all mean? I gave you this slide because a lot of times we don't have the words well-defined. So this came from WHO. So what do they mean by well-being? Our objective with the vaccines to reduce death, disease burden, societal impact. What do we mean by equal respect? That means that different individual and groups um, have equal consideration, that we've not just said, well, I really like white males that are between the ages of 25 and 60, and I'm going to focus on them. It means you're going to focus on everybody where this is the issue. Global equity, <laughs> ensure equal allocation globally. And we know we failed miserably on that one. And not just with COVID, but we've done this with MPOX vaccines. We have failed. We didn't learn. Unethical. National equity, ensure that even equity seeking groups and deserving groups are not left behind the vulnerable ones. And then reciprocity, it should bear significant additional risks and burdens are spread out that they're 
as equitably as we can do this and legitimacy that all countries have a transparent consultation process for dessert, for de- determining what's going to be happening there. And that's again, your NITAGs and other groups. So we all know we did, we did terribly about national equity. Okay. With COVID vaccines, we had countries that just didn't have access. We talked about this over and over and over again. But the one thing that I didn't hear talked about that needed to be talked about is right down here at the bottom to afford COVID vaccines. It, it costs money to deliver the COVID vaccine. It's not just that it's sitting in the warehouse to cover the cost to have 70% of the populations done in a high income country. It was going to increase the healthcare budget by 0.8%. Totally absorbable. In a low-income country, the modeling showed it was going to take 56.6% of their whole health care budget. Uh, we got an equity problem there. Okay, And so you need to be thinking about equity not just in the access to the vaccines, but in what is the impact on health care budgets, because it meant other things don't get done. All right. I want to talk about equity within Canada. I'm allowed to do this. is my country, so I can show our dirty linen. So if you look at one of our territories, which is called Nunavut, and just to make sure you understand Nunavut, it's 20% of the geography of Canada, and we're the second biggest geographic country in the world. Nunavut is bigger than the UK, all of the UK, and all of Ireland, and a good chunk of France on top of it, okay? It only has 37,000 people. All right. So everybody gets 50 square kilometers. But the point I want to tell you, so healthcare delivery is not simple, folks. Okay. And many of these are only fly in communities uh, or in the winter. uh, You may be able to use the ice roads to get trucks in, but most of them are just fly in. Um, So the problem is they had the highest rates of cervical cancer in Canada by far. The inequity, I am embarrassed to tell you. They were the last region in Canada to get access to HPV vaccine. And that's wrong. Totally wrong. So you need to be thinking about as as you're rolling out programs, where is it needed the most first and roll out there? We should have done this the other way around. You know, anyways, my embarrassment. Um, Autonomy. This is uh, the example I'm going to talk about is school-based vaccine programs. And I'm also going to talk about long-term care. So it's, uh, Kathy's told you, it's not ethical if you don't get consent, okay? But what about school-based programs? There's a lot of factors that may impact on consent, okay? And immunization program issues that arise from that. So is the consent understandable? Is it in the language that they, I think, is the literacy level there? Is it in keeping with social and community norms? All the things Kathy talked about trials, it's the same when we're delivering it in a program. I don't mean that we're going to hand out a 14-page consent, but we need to make sure that they understand both the child who's receiving it and the parent or their guardian what it is we're doing and what we're giving. Um, can the student consent for themselves? I'm going to talk a little more about that in a minute. What's the age of the student? Is there a system if a parent's got a concern, how uh, it, can it be answered in some way that's a, efficient? And uh, what happens if the parent doesn't turn the consent form back in? Does that kid just get left out? Because you don't know if not return means they're against the vaccine or they just didn't get it back in. You don't know what it means. So what do you do? And I put this with a star and a red box because this one doesn't get addressed very well. What do you do about the kids that are not in school? Because they're often the higher risk kids. And we you do have a program for them of how you're going to catch them up because it's unethical not to do that. So this is the information confusion. This is the HPV vaccine when we first rolled it out in Canada that we have uh, 10 provinces and three territories. And if you read the consent information from all of those, which we did and we published this, you wouldn't have believed they were the same vaccine. So I'll have, you know, in some of the provinces, it caused nausea and vomiting. In others, it didn't. In some of them, what I'm trying to say is most of these symptoms were ISRRs, okay? And instead of moving them from the vaccine and saying it's really not vaccine related, some of them put them all in, some of them didn't. Now, to be fair to them, this was before we really had talked a lot about ISRRs, but this was incredibly confusing to parents when they would go and look up the data and look up what was online. 
And uh, so you have to be careful. We had 13 different variations in our country. Students' decision. This is about assent or disagreeing and the law and what healthcare workers do. So what is the ability in your school program for the student to agree or disagree with or without parental decision, the parental decision? And what's the legal ramifications? So remember in the diagram, I showed that very complicated Canadian diagram where it had the purple box. Well, law matters in this case. Okay. So you may want high uptake of vaccine in your school kids, but if the parent doesn't agree to do that, by law, you may not be able to do anything. Okay. It, it depends on the country you live in. So here we go. The variation, I, I didn't do a world search. Sorry. I didn't have time. But many countries' legal frameworks allow the students to consent for vaccination if they're competent. The problem is the degree of competency varies with different ages in different countries. All right. Some countries, there's no advice. They just leave it up to the frontline healthcare worker to decide what they want to do. Okay. And even if there's a law, it doesn't mean it always happens. So the parental refusal may be prioritized over what the student wants to do. The healthcare worker may disagree in principle with the student having a decision making power here. Um, the healthcare worker may not even know what the law is. Why would they? They're not lawyers. And healthcare workers in other countries do support um, student autonomy, for example, in Tanzania. They can do this even if their parents don't consent. So acceptable age for consent, whoa, varies a lot. Uh, some would say 10 and up, some say 12 and up, some say 14 and up, some say 9 and up. Okay, so if, what is your program? And do the nurses at the front line know the law in your country regarding this and what the program's expectation is in regarding this? Or are they just making their own little decision here? Okay, because it's not fair in this school these kids get to decide, even if their parents have said no, if that's the law in the country. It's unethical that they get an opportunity and the ones where the healthcare worker says, nope, you can't do this if the parents said no. That's not ethical. It's not equity either. All right. Then what do we do with older adults? And how do we know if they're able to give consent? So that, and now that we have vaccines across the life course with IA2030, understanding, appreciation, reasoning, expressing a choice, and decision-making support. And when you have people in long-term care facilities who have dementia, they can't do these things, all right? But there's a double whammy here, which is why I did this slide, because we know, for example, that COVID has a higher mortality rate in this group, as does flu. We used to say pneumonia was the old man's friend. You have to die from something. All right. But the other problem is if we don't immunize them, and we saw this over and over in long term care facilities in many countries, it spreads like wildfire through the facility because people weren't immunized. We see it every year with flu through the facility if they're not all immunized. So, what is the issue here? Do we need to get whoever holds the consent, the medical uh, directive consent, for the, and have to do all the families? What if they say, no, I think it's time for granny to die. It's okay if she gets COVID or flu. It's not okay for the people around granny. Okay. So how do we deal with this dilemma? All right. And what are the ethics of this? And does your immunization program even have a comment on this and a directive for how people should be doing this? Again, you need to have the structure set up to do this in an ethical fashion. All right. Uh, pregnancy, you had a big debate about this, and we heard lots of comments, so I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to say a couple of things that for me really, really, really matter and make me very angry. Please, we have to, when we're weighing up the risks of using a vaccine, when we don't have all the data we need, what is the mortality rate for the mother, the pregnant woman? If the mortality rate is 50%, I know of no vaccine that would ever get past a phase two trial that has a 50% mortality, and they are big enough to detect a 50% mortality. So get a life, all right? 
the risks of the vaccine, if the disease risk and the mortality rate with the vaccine is 50 percent, I don't need to know anything more. If it's teratogenic, at least I've got a live mother. OK, so I really think we need to put this in perspective. And we haven't had the kind of discussion that we need around this and what the ethical principles should be in making these decisions. For sure, we need much more uh, research. We need more attention to this. We need to support academic champions for it. We need to f uh, have the professional societies of obstetricians, gynecologists, and midwives really come out very hard on where they think we need to go with all of these. And then we as immunization programs need to pay attention to that. And we need to understand how to bring it up and discuss it with our pregnant women because they're seeing all the media stuff that's out there. And vaccine advocacy groups and women themselves need to be speaking up because I'm sorry, but a dead mom means a dead baby too. This is a twofer in negative, okay? Not a twofer. The immunization that's going to prevent that mother from dying is likely going to prevent that baby from dying as well. Now, if the baby has some teratogenicity, that's not a good thing, but it's better than a dead baby and a dead mom. Okay, mandatory immunization had a debate on this. Okay, so I'm just going to emphasize a couple of quick points. Um, where do these come from? It may, it often is the government and the politicians and the community. They want to control this problem. Okay. So they want to make, make it mandatory. It could be a legal action. It may be a law that's put into place. So there are countries where routine immunization in children and in infants is mandatory up to one country, which I will not name because I think it's an embarrassment. You go to jail as a parent if you don't do this. I think that's pretty excessive myself because then the child that you're mandating the vaccine for doesn't have the parent to look after them like duh okay or it could be a requirement but not a law okay and there may be a penalty of some sort the real issue i want to bring up here is not all the bits around mandatory it's about the ethical conflict between autonomy i have the right to decide what's going to happen to me or my children versus medical coercion okay you are getting this. And it violates the right to review, refuse, as Kathy talked about. It. It's coercive, but it may be greater good of the group, okay, where you're going to help protect all of those other people around you or those kids around you. So it's not easy. And so and the other part I have is, what is the place of informed consent if it's not voluntary? Do I just sign that I got it? You told me and I got it because I didn't have a choice, okay? Um, what information should be provided? Do I need to provide anything? I need to tell you what you got, but I'm not telling you like, like it's, not, it's you don't get an opinion here. Okay. You can't change. Um, and what are the options available to those who've had serious AEFI? And what about coverage for medical adverse events? And in some countries, it, it, it depends whether it's a medical compensation act or a, med, a vaccine support program, because it depends on your country what you've got. In countries that have um, full publicly funded health care, the health care costs for the adverse events is it's paid for. But if you don't have that, what happens? And who's responsible for paying for that? And then if you have a, an injury or a disability, again, some countries have disability programs. Doesn't matter how you got to be disabled. There's compensation for that. It's not specific. Could be from vaccine. It could be from a car accident. You're still disabled. What are we doing for you? Again, who's going to pay for this? And should we look at manufacturers? Should we, uh, or the government? Or how's this going to be done in programs, especially where this isn't available? And what about non-immunization of um, healthcare workers because they put other people at risk when they're not immunized? So for me, a hard stop is hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is so contagious. You know, it's a tiny, tiny, you can't even see an infinitesimal amount of blood and you can infect patients. We know this. We saw this. We know it. And if you want to protect your healthcare workers, they need to be immunized against hepatitis B. I understand why that's mandatory. Okay. Because you're putting the population they're caring for at risk and you're putting the fellow workers that they're working with at risk if everybody's not immunized. We have to have a conversation about this. It's not simple. And then reciprocity. If you don't report AEFIs, First of all, as I said earlier, you've got to find the AFIs, and that is unethical not to go looking for them. But when you find them, 
the person who reported them, the healthcare worker who reported that AEFI and the patient or the family that had the AEFI, the serious AEFI, they should not find out that it was due to the vaccine on social media and in the press and on TV. They should be informed when the causality assessment's been done before the media know about it and before it's out on social media. It's unethical to find out after the fact. Why is this so important? It's about anchoring. We estimate by starting from a value we know about. So a healthcare worker who sees a serious AAFI and they think it's due to the vaccine, if you don't come back and tell them it was not due to the vaccine, they will forever have this locked in their head. And it will change how they advise on immunization. And then I, I do one other thing. Crisis, well, I heard somebody else ask, what about crisis communications and these things? I love the CERC principles. Be first. Be right. Be credible. Express empathy. Promote action and show respect. It doesn't mean you come out and say, well, it was due to the vaccine. No, no, no. Be first says, We've had this serious adverse event. We're investigating it. We will be back to talk to you when we know more. Blah, 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 blah. But in that whole conversation you're going to have, our, our, we have great empathy for the family that's struggling at the moment around this, la, 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 and all the bits that go with that, because you want to be empathetic and you want to be seen as being empathetic. And you also have to say, what actions are you taking? It doesn't mean you're stomping the vaccine. All right? And you may even have to say why you're not stopping the vaccine. All right. And you need to show respect. You don't say, not your business. And I've seen speakers from immunization programs not doing, they're doing it all wrong. Okay. Um, and they're hiding. They don't want to come out until they know everything. Well, I've also seen it done brilliantly. And when it's done brilliantly, it's just amazing how it changes everything. So I was in, I don't, is there anybody from Cuba here this year? I didn't think so, but anyways, um, when I was in Cuba a number of years ago with a, an exchange program, um, there, uh, I don't speak Spanish, sadly, but on the six o'clock news, the person who was my translator was with me. He says, Oh, no, you'd be interested in this. There was a six year old in one of the Havana clinics who got his immunization who, what did he have? I can't remember. He fell down and hit his head or did something like that. Whatever. It doesn't matter what it was. And then he said, let me tell you what they're saying. And they were doing exactly this. They said, there has been this event. This is what the event actually was. We'll be back to you tomorrow night to tell you where we are in our investigation. Stay tuned. And there wasn't a big kerfuffle about it. Do, do you know what I mean? Because it was all part of the thing. Anyways, they're, they're very good at it. So lastly, I think every immunization program, whether you're at a national level or a regional level needs to be thinking about where an ethics checkup fits in there. Are you looking at the benefits? Is your NITAG doing what they need to do? What about risk? What about effectiveness? What about equity within your country and within your region and within your district? Or have you just gone after the easy people, the ones that you can easily access and say, done. Um, and what about autonomy? What about reciprocity? And what about trust? Are you building trust? Thank you. Thank you, Noni. Lovely lecture, as usual. And I don't know how to do this, but short questions and short answers. <laughs> it's very difficult in this, well, this field. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. I am Wahid from Pakistan. Uh, we have different groups uh, uh, for vaccine hesitancy in our country. Yeah. Uh, those who even don't know about the polio vaccine, illiterate group, uh, and uh, there are misconceptions that polio is not safe. But we are facing issues with very high, highly educated persons who know everything about the polio vaccine. Uh, even they said that there is chances of vaccine derived polio. So. <laughs> How much you are sure that my child will not get this disease after vaccinated? Because of that reason, they don't give us consent. So what we can do? Okay, that's flipping back to the other talk yesterday. But let me just say two things. Number one is a polio vaccine. I don't know what you're using in your country. Are you using IPV or are you using OPV? All right, OPV does have a risk. We know this. But what we really know, about OPV and vaccine-derived 
paralytic polio is it is seen in countries with low overall immunization rates. And that, I think, doesn't get explained well enough. All right. So that child not getting OPV means that child is at far higher risk of getting polio than the child who's been immunized. And the risk is much higher to actually have symptoms than just having asymptomatic polio. And the data you can show them is that's why we've had cases of paralytic polio in Israel, because it was in a sect that did not immunize. Everybody else didn't get it because they were immunized. But polio is really sneaky. It goes in and goes boom, boom. And if you have enough unimmunized, one in a hundred of them are going to get paralytic disease. So I think it's because they don't understand the context well enough. So, please. Thank you very much. I'm Pamela, from, Pamela from Cameroon. I want to share something with you and then get your opinion. In my country, originally the minister issues a letter when we have a campaign and every the parents are informed in the and they give their consent, usually verbal consent. When the COVID struck, we decided to do like a written consent and we shared to the parents and there was a lot of backlash mm -hmm. because they said, you didn't do this before. And since you're introducing this, it means there is something. It may be more dangerous. Exactly. I shouldn't do this. You're more scared. Yes. So yeah. we had to stop Yeah. because the written consent doesn't work for us yeah. in public campaigns. Yeah. So you've raised a really, really important issue. If you are changing a process that you've done forever, okay, you have to have a very, very good reason for changing that process that has good scientific background for changing that process or else your public's going to get confused and you need to have gone out and done a communications program to say, we're doing this because now I can't see why you would do it written or verbal differently here, but maybe they had something that I don't know. Um, and, and why they did that. I have no idea. Please. Yes. Um, thanks, Noni. Um, for thinking about COVID-19 vaccines and the prioritization roadmap, we did a, when we developed that, there was a, the whole prioritization was developed on, uh, I guess, the risk of disease and prioritization based on mortality and morbidity. But what we didn't necessarily do well is look at the social determinants of health, prioritization based on social determinants of health. And perhaps there's two ways and there might be an overlap, but what can we actually do better for, especially in emergency contexts when we think about, um, how do we prioritize and what's the balance between risk prioritization versus the social determinants and the underserved. Yeah, population. there are many factors that you've got to take in. It's, it's social determinants health is one and context is another one. Um, and uh, so what's their probability of risk in the context they're in? We prioritized healthcare workers. But in Canada, for example, we did not prioritize frontline first responders and we did not prioritize people that were in essential jobs, okay, that if they didn't do their job, um, we were going to shut down, okay, because we need food distri distribution. We need those kinds of things. We didn't do that. And I think COVID was a lesson to all of us when you don't have enough vaccine. Where do you go first? And I think we need to be, we've learned our lesson. We need to be much more multidimensional than doing that. So, again, Dirty Linen from Canada. We had a particular area around Toronto, which is a major distribution for all kinds of stuff. And um, the people that were wearing, that were managing the warehousing and getting the stuff out and delivered were not prioritized. They had one of the highest rates of COVID infection spread, and they brought it home to their multi-generational families, and they had big incidences of mortality in the older age groups in which they lived. We did, we did badly, okay? And so... I think each country needs to look at that prioritization thing in a crisis when you don't have enough vaccine, but take it in your context and think about what's going to happen if you do it rigidly that way. I don't think globally you can ever provide a map that's going to work for everybody, but I think the principles of the map can be taken into account. That's the best answer I can give. I don't know, Perry, if you want to say anything more. I mean, we all struggled with this. It was terribly hard. <laughs> Indeed. Please. 
I thought you raised your hand. Well, I, um, hi, I'm Sarah from the U.S. I, I had a similar actually comment, so that's why I lowered my hand. I mean, I think we really struggled because we did want to provide vaccine to those who were disproportionately affected yeah. by COVID, but often those were groups that were, you know, socially vulnerable or had suffered from social inequities. And so we want to give them earliest benefits, but because the balance of benefits and harms aren't known um, up front, could that be exposing them early on to harms? And then Matt and I were just talking, you know, there was also, you know, because some of some of the early prioritization discussions also in, involved should certain racial and ethnic minority groups because of their risks, but that that was also viewed as potentially stigmatizing. So it's, it was actually a very complicated. Uh... So let me give you a terrible example from H1N1, and you can understand why this becomes really complicated, especially for the community themselves. When H1N1 came, there was a significant mortality among our indigenous communities. So some bright acre in the government, I have no idea who, who he or she was, decided they would send up the body bags in the same plane that came with the vaccine. Now, what do you think the communities thought when the body bags came with the vaccine? That they were being guinea pigs, okay? And so you have to be very careful when you're doing this. It comes back to the communication issue we were talking about. If you're changing a process or you're changing how you're prioritizing, you need to be working with those communities to understand that they understand why this is being done the way it's being done. And they have to agree that this is how they think it should be done. I, I think this was the worst thing I'd ever heard that should send up body bags with vaccines. And it said it on the outside of the bags when they were unloading them at the airport. They don't have airports on the runway. One last question all the way in the back. <laughs> there are two of them there. That's why. Right. So go ahead, both of you, but very quickly, please. Thank you. I have two comments, one on uh, the consent form. This was already covered by Pamela. The second comment is about um, the immunization pain training for staff for help. We are not aware of that. Thank you very much for uh, raising this. And I'll add a comment to that to say that WHO has a training module okay. that has just been reviewed again. It was put together in uh, around 2018 or 19. Okay. It takes about 20 minutes to do. It'll be translated into a number of languages. And that should be available, I think, before the end of 2023. Okay. So if you can share with us the links or the document about that, yeah. it would yeah. be useful for API manager. What we could do, uh, we can put up the WHO uh, recommendation document. No. I, can, I, I have the module, but it's not going to be the final uh, module, so I, I don't know what you want to do with that. <laughs> Please. Hi, my name is Alicia. I work in obstetrics in the U.S. Um, as a frontline worker, I really appreciate um, your comments about PPE. And I think healthcare workers, from a healthcare clinician um, point of view, healthcare workers will continue to do the right thing. Um, but I wonder, and I, you know, I'm on panels and I give talks all the time about this, but what are we doing? And maybe this is for every, all the leaders here. What are we doing at national and international levels to really try to reimburse healthcare workers for their time and counseling? Because I think studies after studies have shown that if a trusted healthcare worker recommends and offers a vaccine, the person will get it. And I think if we reimbursed uh, counseling about vaccination to the same degree that we reimburse for procedures, I think we'd see vaccination rates skyrocketing because then, you know, for example, from a clinical point of view, I have 20 minutes with a patient. I have to get everything done. And these are high risk patients. And so even addressing their vaccine concerns, I don't get reimbursed for that time. And all it does is make me write my notes at 6, 7, 8 p.m. at night. So I guess my question is, like, when will leaders kind of put their money where their mouth is and actually not rely on the goodwill of healthcare workers for every single thing? Not every single thing, but almost every single thing. You raised the really fundamental issue is that um, governments have not accepted how important vaccines are. I think a lot of them were blown away by what COVID did to their economies. And that was a new thing for them. And I think we have not 
respected healthcare workers and the importance of their role in immunization, not the frontline public health immunizers who are running clinics and stuff like that, but all the other healthcare workers who come in contact with people who need to be immunized. Um, and I do think um, the importance of immunization has been stressed over and over at the World Health Assembly. It's certainly there in the IA 2030, and all countries signed on to that, all 194 signed on. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's trickled down from the government, the Minister of Health signing, to making the frontline peace work. And I think we do need to have more discussion on that and probably some commentaries written that can be sent to ministers of health, um, you know, one or two pages about why this is so important. And can I take 90 seconds to tell one little story? One of the things in Uganda, there was a micro research project, a whole other thing that I do, we don't need to talk about. But one of the projects there, they tried to find out why in this district they had so little uptake, much less 65% for infant immunization versus the districts around them. What was going wrong? And they did both a survey and they did also a qualitative thing. So in the survey, they found out the big problem, duh, was vaccine stockouts and healthcare workers stockouts. So you'd get to the clinic where you were supposed to be vaccinated and, then the, and you couldn't get vaccinated. Well, if you've walked four kilometers, you're only going to do that so many times and then you're going to give up. So they then went to ask the ones who hadn't given up why they hadn't given up. And that's why for you, this is really important. And almost all of those had been mothers who had been an extremist instead of delivering in the village. They'd had to be taken out of the village and transferred to the re referral hospital where they almost died or did die, some of them, or, and or their babies died. And the nurses in all of those cases within the first two, three days after the baby was born had told them to a person how important immunization was. So when these mothers were falling in love with their baby, a very precious baby, they heard something else they could help the baby with. And those mothers walked sometimes eight times to get immunization. Similar study, the motivational interviewing study across Canada that was done for motivational interviewing within the first 72 hours of delivery, 10 minutes. Vaccine is really important. Time to ask a few questions about it. Increase in uptake at two, four, and six months of three to 7% more. So this is cheap, all right? But you need to be paid to do this, and it needs to be part of the program. Um, but it could be done in low to high-income countries without a huge cost out there, but people have to know and they have to know how to do it. So I think we need to talk much more about the importance of immunization, the cost of not immunizing. I showed you the cost for COVID yesterday when you don't get somebody immunized. We need much more conversation on this.